us versus them. Now, with this series, I have had multiple questions from different people asking, what is this all about? This doesn't seem like a typical, uh, a typical sermon series. What does it mean to have uh, a Christian sermon series entitled Us Versus Them? Now, if you're one of these people who is asking about this, this title, that is a good thing. Being curious about why are we speaking about us versus them. And the foundation passage for this whole series that we're going to be uh, using over three weeks comes from Matthew 5, verses 43 to 44, where Jesus says this, You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. What does Jesus tell us? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Earlier on this year, right at the start of our year, here at Braco, we spent uh, a week simply speaking about the defining aspect of what it means to be the church. How are disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus, to be known? And we find that the answer is really, really clear. They are to be known by their love for other people. They're not to be known by being able to cite the most amount of verses or know the most theology, even though these are good things. They're not to be known by their amount of service or attending church, even though these are good things, but they are to be known, recognised by their love for other people. Now, if this is true, if we are to be known by our love for others, why is it Why is it that the church often is recognised by what we are against, then who or what we are for? There is a uh, a really well-known quote by a guy called Brendan Manning where he says this, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out the door and deny Him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Now, I agree with this quote, I agree with what Brendan Manning has to say right here, but not because I don't think that the the church is desiring to grow in holiness and Christ-likeness, or that we don't have a desire to see lost people saved, but because if you go down the street and you ask someone, what is a Christian? If you were going to define what a Christian looks like, how would you define them? often the answer would not be known by their love for other people. Now, love is not just this, uh, this broad phrase of something intangible that we can't really recognise uh, what it looks like. It is something that grows in us as we grow in our relationship with Jesus. Now, for those of you who are followers of Jesus, at the point of becoming a follower of Jesus you had the Holy Spirit come and indwell within you. And as the Holy Spirit moves in our life and, uh, and makes its temple within us as believers in Christ, we grow in our love for other people. But there are other fruit that are also demonstrated as we grow in love for others. Uh, Galatians 5, 22 uh, to 23 is really clear about what the fruit looks like when we have the Holy Spirit moving in our life. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I'm just going to read that list once again. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, sometimes when we think about the, the fruit of the Spirit, I've heard it spoken about as, uh, by some people as they are excelling in, in one area of the fruit of the Spirit. They might be an incredibly uh, joyful person, but they struggle with all the other aspects. Or some people might say, uh, I've got one of these fruit going really, really well. I'm a really, uh, or I've got all of these going really well, except for one of these areas. And we can uh, have a tendency to think of the fruit of the Spirit a bit like a punnet of strawberries. So, 
If one has gone bad and one's uh, not operating as it should be, that's okay because the most, uh, most of them are going really, really well. But when we look at the fruit of the Spirit, it is not multiple different fruits that we can pick and choose and say, this is the one I, uh, I, I want to focus on. It is one fruit of the Spirit. Far better way to understand it is more like this, uh, this banana. And so if one thing is going wrong, if things become infected and are going wrong in, uh, in the fruit of the Spirit in our life, then the whole thing becomes infected and goes wrong. I just want to let you know as well, this has been sitting in our staff fridge for, uh, for months and months. So uh, I, uh, I assume it's uh, David Chatelli is probably. We are to grow in every single one of these areas in our life as God's Spirit begins working in us and making us more like Christ growing in the fruit of the Spirit. But this is not the mentality that our culture encourages us to have. The narrative of our culture does not fit with the narrative of growing in the fruit of the Spirit, particularly here in our Western culture. We have a culture that is and is becoming increasingly polarized. Our culture is increasingly becoming a culture of us versus them, of war, of battling with one another. So why is this? Why are things becoming increasingly polarized in today's society? If you're joining with us online, you have access right now to a wealth of information, to an amount of information that uh, mankind has never known through the internet. We are able to access any amount of information that we want at any time. Now, if you have ever looked up anything on, on the internet, if you've looked up things on YouTube or Facebook, Instagram, whatever, what happens is, uh, is you'll notice this thing that shows up on the side which says, recommended for you. And so if you look up something, it will show you things similar to what you have looked up and it will, uh, and it will recommend something similar. Now, what this hap- uh, does for, for us when we look things up on, online is this means if we look up something with a certain point of view we might click on something else that uh, encourages that point of view and uh, only, uh, only look at things that, uh, that encourage this, uh, this one perspective. We might become more staunch in this view and think everyone else must think like this because this is the only thing that I am seeing. And so we might think that anyone who disagrees with us, they are the enemy. Everyone must agree with me because this is all I am seeing and, and there can't be anyone who, who possibly is able to disagree with me. And there has been a term that has uh, developed over the past few years that has described this uh, phenomena, which is herd mentality. The belief that you have to align yourself with a group or tribe or camp and whatever this group thinks, whatever this camp or tribe thinks, that is what I need to think as well, and then demonize anyone who disagrees. Now, I am on the receiving end of this uh, a few times every single year, where I get uh, demonized by a certain group of people. Uh, And some of you might feel this way even right now, as I'm uh, about to put something on my head. Uh, I am a, uh, a loyal, faithful Parramatta Eel supporter. And every single year, me and my dad, we head off to Suncorp Stadium, or most years we head off to Suncorp Stadium, and we go and we watch Parramatta absolutely smash the Broncos. And it is a great experience, but in that environment, everyone is looking at us and, uh, and most people are not favourable uh, to Parramatta supporters who are very vocal against Broncos supporters at Suncorp Stadium. Now, although that happens, there is a, uh, 
something that people get even more passionate about, which is uh, when I put on this cap, my, uh, my trusty blues cap, there are three times a year that people look at me with this cap on and they are not favourable at all. They are, uh, even for you who are joining with us online right now, if you are a Queensland supporter, you might be looking at me and uh, viewing me as the enemy. I should just keep this on the whole time, shouldn't I, just to, uh, to encourage you all. <laughs> now, although this is, uh, is quite light-hearted, there are multiple areas in our life where we might, um, where we might be, uh, create an us-versus-them mentality. Uh, a while ago, there was a movie that came out called The Blind Side, and it's all about this, uh, uh, this boy called Michael who is, uh, who is taken in uh, by a family, and this family uh, encourages him and gives them the means to be able to play American football. And he excels at this. He becomes really, really good uh, in high school at, uh, at American football. But one of the things, if you're going to play football in, a, in America in high school, you have to keep your grades at a certain level. And uh, one of the significant characters is someone called Miss Sue, who comes and becomes Michael's tutor. And there is this really great scene with Miss Sue when she's being interviewed to become Michael's tutor. And, uh, and what happens during this scene is she says to the, to the family, hey, there is something before you you employ me, there is something that you must know about me. This is really, really crucial. You have to know that I am a Democrat. It's an uh, amusing scene of, uh, of someone who is explaining their, their point of view and a bit nervous if there is going to be, coming against her, an us versus them mentality. Now, we can find ourselves in camps and tribes all the time, all the time in, in life. Theologically, there are different groups who have differing points of view. The age-long debate of Calvinism versus Arminianism, being a complementarian or an egalitarian. Should we baptise adults or infants? What should communion look like? Should worship be contemporary or traditional? We have political views, Liberal or Labour, Republican or Democrat, Conservative or Progressive. In friendship groups, I'm guessing that, that some of you may have been part of friendship groups where you have seen two people go at one another in an us versus them mentality and you have been forced to align yourself with a particular party. In the church, have you ever personally viewed someone with a different point of view as the enemy. Last week, uh, John Sweetman came and spoke at our 40th uh, anniversary for the church. And one of the things I asked John was, what's one of the, the values that's carried through uh, Bracco throughout 40 years? And one of the, the things that he, he mentioned was diversity. Now, diversity has the potential of, uh, of becoming um, a difficult thing in the life of the church because it can create an us versus them mentality or it can create a beautiful picture of love when people who don't necessarily always agree with one another or don't necessarily look or act like one another are still loving one another and coming together and worshipping Jesus. The goal of this series the goal of our time together is not to convince you of a particular point of view. I've already said you have a wealth of, uh, of things on the internet to be able to, uh, to look at, to gain a point of view. But when you have a point of view, how are we able to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit to those who don't necessarily agree with us? It is very very easy to show and demonstrate love to others who agree with us, but it is more difficult to do it for people who we don't always agree with. Now, this series over three weeks is more like one giant sermon over three weeks, so make sure you, are, you join with us for the whole thing. 
Uh, now, this morning, I just want to spend some time, uh, that was a really long intro, but don't worry, it's, uh, <laughs> we're going to keep going. Um, yeah, the, this morning, I just want us to spend some time looking at the foundation of, of what this should look like in the heart of the believer. How do we break down an us versus them mentality? And it comes right at the start of Scripture. So if you have your Bibles, I do invite you to open up to Genesis 1. It'll be on the screen as well where you can uh, read along. And in Genesis 1, we see God creating. God creating all things. And then it comes to the pinnacle when mankind is created. And in verse 26 to 27, we uh, we see this. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in His image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. The key, the foundation to breaking down an us versus them mentality is to see others as who they really are, as people who have been created in the image of God. Every single person watching this right now, if you're joining with us, you have been created in the image of God. There are a whole heap of things that this means for us. But at the heart of this, being created in the image of God, it means that we were created to resemble God, to have aspects and attributes of God. Humanity, we are different than all of the rest of creation. We were created with emotion and spirit, creativity, intellect and the ability to reason. And it's because of this that when everything else was created, God said it was good, but when mankind was created in His image, He said, this is very good. Being created in the image of God means that we were created to resemble aspects and parts of who God is, His character and His nature. Now, we have been marred. We have been broken and scarred because of sin, but we have still been made to resemble God. And because of this, because we have been made in this image, we have been placed here on earth to rule. We are rulers, uh, having been created in the image of God. Now, this language might be a bit strange for you to hear, um, uh, that it means that we have been made uh, as, as rulers. Now, during ancient times, most people were under the rule of a king or a monarch or, uh, or some kind. Uh, many of these monarchs, they claimed to be either God himself or a God. Now, the language that they, uh, that they would often use Uh, to describe themselves, wasn't describing themselves as God, but they would describe themselves as the image of God. And so, these people, these monarchs and kings, they would define what is right and what was wrong for the people of the day. They would define what they thought was good and evil in their kingdoms. Now, after naming themselves as, as, uh, as God or an image of God, they would create statues around their kingdom Uh, and idols built as extensions of themselves. And so that's why we see throughout uh, throughout Scripture, when someone creates a, uh, a statue or an idol, many people would then bow down to this idol and worship it as God, because this was an extension of the, uh, of the king or the monarch of the time. These were uh, not just images, but they were... Um, but they were extensions of the king themselves, which is why so many people would worship them. 
This is why when we, uh, if you've gone anywhere overseas and you've been able to see different ancient civilizations, you would have seen uh, that there are many, many uh, ancient idols throughout, uh, made throughout history. But this is also one of the reasons that in the Ten Commandments, God commanded the people not to make idols of God, not to make extensions or little uh, gods throughout the earth, not to make statues of Him. We shouldn't try and project the image of God onto other things because we ourselves, we have been called the image of God. And as someone who is the image bearer of the King, we have been placed on this earth as a ruler. This is heart of what was spoken about here in Genesis 1 verses 26 to 27. So that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. This is part of what we have been created here for, to rule on God's behalf and fill the earth with His image. And this is where the fruit of the Spirit comes in, displaying His image here on earth. But also, as a ruler, as someone who has been made in the image of God, this means that, yes, you have been made to resemble God, you are a ruler, but you also have huge worth and huge value. Last week, John spoke to us from Psalm 8, uh, speaking to us that we have been made a little lower than the angels. (laughs) Dust, but also diamonds. You are not an accident, you are not a mistake. You are created with a plan and a purpose by an incredible King who loves you so much. Now, this is a wonderful thing for us to hear, but it is not just you who has been created in the image of God, but everyone that you come into contact with. Yes, we have been scarred and marred by sin, so this image isn't perfect and it isn't what it should be, but every person has been created in the image of God and every person has significant value and significant worth because of the Father. And we must begin seeing everyone that we come into contact with as God does. God sees us, His image walking around here on earth. And we should begin treating one another as God would treat us. One of the, uh, one of the ways that I see Jesus addressing this, what it looks like to treat others as, uh, as image bearers, is, uh, is when Jesus describes this beautiful story of the Good Samaritan. In Luke 10, verses 30 to 37, it says this, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He took him. Uh, He he went to uh, his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day... He took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The experts in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. These Samaritans were not the most liked group of people. They were natural enemies of the Israelites. And yet what we see here is this beautiful example of what it means to treat another person as an image bearer of God. This Samaritan showed love and kindness towards someone else who was a natural enemy, but he displayed love towards him. The proof of your value, 
the proof that we are image bearers created with worth and meaning and value is demonstrated through what we read in Genesis and demonstrated through through what Jesus uh, through what Jesus says, but no more clearly demonstrated than by what Jesus did for us on the cross. Jesus saw that we had so much worth and so much value and loved us so, so much that he chose to die for us. That even though our image is scarred and broken, we are able to have a renewed image when we uh, come into relationship with Jesus. Because you are an image bearer, God counted you as valuable enough to die for you. But he doesn't just leave it there. <laughs> he doesn't just leave us as, uh, as, as image bearers of himself. But we are called to see others as Jesus sees them and to treat others in that way. Every single person that we come in contact with who is an image bearer of the King. It means for us this week, when you're at your workplace, when you go down to the supermarket, when you meet up with friends, whoever you see, treat them as Jesus would, as an image bearer of God. Let's pray. Yeah, God, thanks so much for, um, for the love that you have for us. For the kindness that you have shown towards us. Even though we are broken images, we are still made in your image. The Almighty God, the King. Lord, for my brothers and sisters who are listening to this right now and have a warped perception of, of how you view them, Lord, I ask that you'll change their heart right now and, and show them how much you love them and how much you care for them. Yes, we are dust, but we are diamonds as well to you, Jesus. Lord, for all of us, we ask that you will help us to not only see ourselves in this light, but see other people as you, as you see them and treat other people with love and treat other people according to the fruit of the Spirit. Lord, I'm just really asking that you will move by your Spirit in every single one of us and help us to grow in all these different aspects we might grow in love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Lord, would you grow us in all of these this week for the glory of your name, in Jesus' name.